is where things are gonna get a little weird. I love it when things are weird. <laughs> Good to know that nothing we've talked about so far has been weird. Yeah. Okay. Hey crazies, welcome to another episode of Wife Reacts. This is my wife, Awkward M. Hello. This video is gonna be an overview of something we call quantum field theory or QFT for short. Basically, it's what is the nature of matter? Why did we invent quantum fields? You know, what was the motivation behind it? That, that sort of thing. So I guess let's start with uh, what exactly do you know about quantum field theory? I was afraid you were gonna ask me this question. <laughs> uh, almost nothing that has to do with quantum particles. Gonna go out on a limb here. Where they come from, where they go, if I had to guess. Mm. But I really don't know. So we're starting from a pretty basic basic set of knowledge here, right? Yes. What is this? It's a ball. It's a ball. So just like anything else, this ball is made of materials, which are then made of molecules, which are then made of atoms, which are then made of subatomic particles. We can just sort of break this down, right? right. It's a method we call reductionism. Ooh. We reduce it into its fundamental parts. Mm -hmm. Now, if we reduce everything in the universe into its fundamental or elementary parts, okay. what we get is a set of elementary particles. Sure. This is all of the fundamental or elementary particles that we are aware of. Yep. And it's a pretty small list. Technically, every single one of these has a, an antiparticle. Most of the things that we experience, we, we interact with on a daily basis, us, all the objects around us, and so on. Uh-huh with very, very few exceptions, are made of three of these particles. The up quark, uh -huh. the down quark, mm -hmm. and the electron. Sure. That's it. Yeah. And those things tend to interact with each other via photons. Those are sort of the four elementary particles that we ever interact with. Light, as we saw from the particle chart, is made of photons, these particles. Yes. What other way do we model photons as? What, what other way do we model light as, I mm -hmm. should say? And if you go all the way back to, yeah, we model it as waves, uh -huh. right? So an electromagnetic wave is a disturbance in something we call the electromagnetic field. And sure. that looks something like this. Yes, I am familiar with this animation. Right, so an, we- An oldie but a goodie. An oldie but a goodie. This is one of my faves. In this animation, you've essentially got all these points across space. Mm -hmm. And each point has a value attached to it, some kind of quantity, in this case, vectors but there's a, a quantity attached to every point in space, and that's mm -hmm. what we refer to as a field. That's what a field is. Sure. What we did back in the late 1800s is we modeled light as a disturbance in that field. Mm -hmm. We do this with lots of things. It's not just with uh, electromagnetism. We can do it with the pressure in a water tank, right? Mm -hmm. We can assign a pressure value to every single point inside the tank. We can do it with temperature. We can do it with temperature, absolutely. When we set up these values as a field, it opens up an entire division of mathematics that we can use on it. Yay! <laughs> it's what I've always wanted. Right, it's a really big deal. We can calculate things like divergences and curls and gradients. And so if we can set up a scenario as a field, it's very useful. It's a very useful tool. It doesn't mean that the field is something that exists. It's just a collection of numbers. Okay. But it's a, a very powerful tool. Sure. The particle concept of a photon rolled around in like the early 1900s, we started to think that, oh, well, maybe everything is a particle and it only looks like it's a disturbance in a field. As we leaned into the particle model, mm -hmm. we started to run into problems, right? We started to run into not being able to incorporate relativity and having to put patches on to explain the hydrogen atom. And people started to ask the question, well, like what if particles aren't how matter works? What if particles are the illusion? And they're actually waves. And they're actually... Disturbances? Disturbances, we say waves, mm -hmm. but waves is kind of, it can be misleading if you're not familiar with the concept already. Do we say waves like we say spin? No, it's not that bad. Okay. But if you wanna call any disturbance in some medium a wave, mm -hmm. sure. But I think it, it might give someone who isn't necessarily familiar with physics the wrong impression. Okay. See, cause like, okay, <laughs> this is a good question. This is a great question. When you hear the word wave, you probably think of, you know, like 
a full wave, maybe on the surface of some water or something, a wave on a string maybe. But in physics, we tend to call any disturbance in uh, some substance or medium or whatever a wave. So even if it's like, boom, and it's a pulse that's traveling along a string, that's still considered a wave, it's still described by the same mathematics. I'm comfortable with that. I yeah. think that's okay. It's, it's still real. Right. And so you gotta kind of be a little more vague. Just because it's not repeating doesn't mean that a wave does not exist. Right. It's still the same, it's, okay. it's still the same phenomenon, even if it's one. Right. I'm gonna stop beating around the bush and we're gonna talk about exactly what a quantum field is. Yes, let's. Okay. We already saw the electromagnetic field where there was this, you know, vector or arrow attached to every point in space. What if particles are the illusion and matter behaves as disturbances in fields instead? Okay. Rather than some value of some measurement being attached to every point in space, it was essentially existence attached to every point in space. Existence. Existence. Of? What we would perceive as a particle. Any particle? Any elementary particle. Yes, okay. Yeah. It's not like only electrons are found in the electron field and only... Up quarks? Up quarks, yes, are found in the up quark field. That's that's how it is. That is how it is. Yes, okay. they each get their own field. Okay. But an up quark and an anti-up quark are in the same field. And an electron and an anti-electron are in the same field. Also known as a positron. Correct. Okay. Every point in space has an existence value, essentially. And you can see that each of those points are wiggling. Every point is okay, wiggling. Sure. That's sort of the quantum uncertainty going mm -hmm. on here, right? If there is a large enough disturbance, a full disturbance in this field, mm -hmm. we perceive that disturbance as a particle. Okay, so if there's a disturbance in the electron field, it might be an electron or a positron, depending on how, what the disturbance looks like. Okay. If there's a disturbance in the photon field, then what we're gonna see is a photon. Sure. We're gonna observe that as a photon, even though the photon isn't really there. There's no really particle there. It's just a disturbance in a field. Is there an antiphoton? Yes, but the antiphoton is just a photon. Photons are wild. Yeah. Okay. It is its own antiparticle. <laughs> but yes, every particle has an antiparticle. It just might be itself. I'm not here for that, <laughs> but okay. The problem with this graphic is that it makes space look like it's discrete, like there are these little pieces and they have size. Right. Which is not really how it works. It's kind of misrepresenting it a little bit. Mm -hmm. But when I made this graphic, like what, five years ago, I didn't really have the animation skill to do better. To do better, right. But now a real quantum field is continuous. There would be a disturbance at an individual point in a continuous space. Okay. Rather than a box being up higher than the rest of the boxes, what you see is a spike mm -hmm. in a surface. Which might be called a wave, if you will. Yes. Mm -hmm. We would treat this spike that moves around as a wave pulse. It's just a disturbance in the electron field, for example. In this case, uh, electric charge is represented by color, red for positive and purple for negative. And quantum spin orientation is represented by the vertical direction, up for spin up and down for spin down. It's a representation that's not really going up and down. These fields are actually three-dimensional, but if I showed you a three-dimensional version of this, your eyes and brain would just be overwhelmed and it wouldn't be useful. Sure. Something we do in physics is we suppress dimensions in order to make sense of things. This is very common. I'm comfortable with that, okay. honestly. In this case, three-dimensional space has been compressed into a two-dimensional plane. Mm -hmm. And we're using that dimension we suppressed as a way to show other information, like quantum spin, for example. And it's not like the fields occupy different places in space. They all occupy all space. Correct. Yes, they're all like coexisting. They all coexist and overlap each other. Right. Which allows particle interactions to happen because then energy can be exchanged mm. between fields. Aha. If you have an electron and a positron come together at the same spot, what you get is antimatter annihilation. Ah, okay. Which is how that works. Sure. They just cancel each other out. They just cancel each other out because they have opposite values. Mm -hmm. And it essentially turns the quantum field to a zero value mm -hmm. or what we would call the vacuum state of the field. And by doing that, by, by assigning existence to every point in space, you're essentially assigning all possible properties for those particles, for those things we perceive as particles into that spot. Mm -hmm. All the information is there. It has to be. Right. Sure. Because existence is there. Mm -hmm. And so this is kind of what separates a quantum field from a regular old field, like the electromagnetic field. 
Poor electromagnetic yeah. fields. An old regular field. <laughs> There's some debate over whether or not these quantum fields actually exist, but the usefulness and accuracy of the model is kind of hard to argue with. Does anything actually exist? I mean, right. like... I mean, we know light exists and we know matter definitely exists, okay. which is the point of this video. We're gonna come back to that. But matter definitely exists. It is not an illusion. We try to represent it in different ways depending on what we need to predict. 1949 rolls around. Mm -hmm. And this one guy, famous guy named Richard Feynman enters the scene. For a while, we have been doing these quantum field calculations and they're real nasty. We're not gonna do any today. It's not, that's not what this video is about. So he came up with something that we now call Feynman diagrams. That's what it is. I'm like, I'm sure I've heard you talk about this before. Okay. Right. But they're basically space-time diagrams, which I've done a ton of videos about. Most of the information from those videos, you don't actually need to understand this. You just need to understand that like time is on the picture. He didn't necessarily in this paper come up with a way to represent all types of particles in, a, in one of these diagrams. He didn't even know about quarks Sure. at the time. Nobody did. But he did come up with a way for things like electrons and positrons to interact with photons, which is what we've been talking about this entire video. If particles come together and interact, we want to be able to represent that and, and be able to calculate what's going to happen with quantum fields. You know, how are things going to go in and how are things going to go out? Straight up is time, is the time axis. Okay. And so as these two particles come together, they do some kind of interaction and then particles then come out. And we want to be able to predict exactly how this is going to take place. We can see the in and we can see the out, like what happened inside of this black box, this mm -hmm. unknown area. Is it important that the lines are angled? Yeah, because they're, they're, the particles are coming together. Gotcha. Horizontal to space. Okay. Coming right? together and then going apart. Yes. Gotcha. Okay. So these particles somehow interacted. Maybe this was like two electrons coming together and then repelling each other. For a while, we would go through, start from like fundamental principles, and we would go through all the nasty quantum field theory calculations and figure out what's going to happen. It was so absurdly difficult. Mm -hmm. The jiggly spots is the vacuum state of the quantum field. What if we can pretend that those wiggles and jiggles are particles? Because if they're not necessarily zero, but they're not like a whole occupation of a spot, they're not, so they're not actual particles, but maybe we can pretend they're particles something that we now call virtual particles. They're not actually particles, mm -hmm. but we can pretend that they are. If we do that, then we can start to simplify the math a little bit. Maybe when the two electrons come together, a photon bounces between them and allows them to repel. They're, they're, maybe they're interacting with this photon. This photon is not a real photon. It's inside that black box. Oh. The only actual particles here are the two electrons coming in and going out. Okay. The problem is this box is unknown. And there are other possibilities, other ways that these part that these electrons can interact with each other via these virtual particles. Okay. We can imagine a more complicated scenario. Maybe they exchange two photons, two virtual photons. They're always virtual because it's in the box. If okay. it's in the black box, it's virtual. Okay. Unless it went in or came out, it's not a real particle. And you know, so maybe they exchange two photons or maybe a photon jumped out of one and jumped back in before they exchanged a photon. Or, you know, maybe they, they went to exchange a photon, but that photon decayed into an electron-positron pair before becoming a photon again, before hitting the other electron. So all of these different scenarios are possible scenarios. Okay. And because the box is unknown and these are virtual particles, we need a way to account for all of them. What it did was it took this huge, nasty calculation that could be really cumbersome and almost impossible sometimes, and it turned it into a bunch of little calculations that are fairly calculable. Okay. And then all you gotta do is add the results together. How many different options are in the box? An infinite number. Yeah, so it doesn't feel doable. Right. When you have to calculate every one of them. <laughs> that's, that's a great question, actually. As it turns out, something that Feynman discovered while he was playing around with this, he was like, well, I mean, I don't have to calculate all of them. That just seems like a lot, you know? Mm -hmm. So what he did was he realized that as he calculated them, the more complicated they were, the smaller of a contribution it made to the calculation. Each of these diagrams has a number of these dots that we refer to as vertexes or vertices. Okay. The number of vertices is a way to determine how much of a contribution that scenario is gonna make. 
at some point you can just stop because the the the, the terms aren't making any contributions. contributions to your calculation. It's going to be negligible. Right. You're going to be close enough. Mm -hmm. Something you might have noticed in those diagrams is that there's really only one type of vertex. Every single one of these vertexes mm -hmm. has two straight lines and a wiggly line. That, that's, that's all that can exist in what we call quantum electrodynamics, which is a type of quantum field theory. Is where things are gonna get a little weird. Oh, <laughs> excellent. I love it when things are weird. <laughs> Good to know that nothing we've talked about so far has been weird. Yeah. Okay. What you've got here is you've got an electron coming in. Mm -hmm. And here's the weird part. This is a positron coming in, even though the arrow points the wrong way. That's what tells us it's a positron. <laughs> you have a question? How do you know if you're dealing with an electron or a positron via the diagram? If it looks exactly the same. Because in a Feynman diagram, we represent antimatter as matter going backward in time. Ah, uh, okay. And so any arrows that point backward in time are antiparticles. Why do we represent it that way? Because they're it not makes the math work backwards out. in time. They're not. Yeah. Not even Feynman thought that. Mm -hmm. He didn't actually say, he, he, he made a point to say like, I don't actually think antiparticles are, are particles going backward in time. That's mm -hmm. ridiculous. Mm -hmm. I feel like he's taking a lot of liberties yeah. with like the virtual particles and the backwards in time now. And it's making me feel like it is less reputable. He viewed this as just a tool for solving quantum field theory problems. He didn't view this as reality. How do you know if the answer to your problem is correct or not. Because you can check it. How? Experimentally. Ah, okay. We've seen that this gives us answers that match reality. Okay, I'm more comfortable with it then. Okay. Okay. So here's one scenario. You've got an electron and a positron coming together, annihilating and making a photon. Okay. Okay, does that make sense? Yes. Okay. So they annihilate each other, they go to zero, but the energy has to go somewhere, and so it gets kind of shunted into the photon field. But if I turn this, now we've got an electron coming in, an electron going out, and photon going out. So now we have, it a, we have an electron emitting a photon and changing direction. Gotcha, yeah. it's a Y. Yeah. Okay. Then here, we have an electron absorbing a photon and then changing direction. But still an electron. But still an electron. They're, all, both the arrows are pointed up in time. Yep. What do we have here? A photon coming in and dividing into an electron and a positron. Exactly. Yeah, see? See, this is, huh? this is how you read these diagrams. Uh -huh. So once you know the rules, you can kind of figure it out, mm -hmm. right? And so you can just keep going. So here we have a similar scenario that we had before, but it's a positron this time. A positron mm -hmm. comes in, absorbs a photon, and changes direction. Okay. Here we've got a positron that emits a photon and changes direction. Isn't that... Oh, okay. And then we're back to the beginning. Gotcha. So like those are the scenarios. Mm -hmm. Those are the only scenarios that can happen in what we call quantum electrodynamics. Okay. Does that make sense? And then you can have variations of this that get more complicated. Right, you can just combine a bunch of these together. Mm -hmm. And how many of these you combine together determines how big of a contribution it makes. Okay. That is the purpose of quantum field theory. It is to predict how these particles will interact. It's about particle interactions. If there are no particle interactions, quantum field theory is kind of useless. Sure. And so what the standard model tells us is that different particles, different fields interact in different ways. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. And we, we do the calculations using things like Feynman diagrams. Okay. We know this racquetball exists. We know that it's made up of fundamental parts, elementary parts mm -hmm. that interact. And we, can, we know what those interactions look like. So those elementary parts might be particles. They might be waves. They might be disturbances in fields. But at the end of the day, they are real things. We're just debating over what kind of real thing they are. Matter does exist. It just wasn't what we originally thought it was. Welcome to science. Yeah. <laughs> and until next time, remember. It's okay to be a little crazy. The multiverse isn't scientific. Why are you even talking about it? It may not be testable, so we can't call it a scientific fact, but it's still scientific. It's based on time-tested models, and it's important to explore the extremes of our models. That's where all the theoretical discovery happens. Anyway, thanks for watching. <laughs>